Well, Seamus, if that's your name, I see in the show notes you say that COVID is hard on introverts, so I want to know what you've done with the real Seamus. So here's a funny thing. I am obviously a massive introvert. My wife is also an introvert. Ugh. That's the thing about us introverts, we can't talk. <laughs> my my wife is an introvert, but way less than me. Okay, she she occasionally needs to talk to people. I apparently don't. Like if there's like a scale mine of like introvertedness, mine is maxed out towards the introvert side. And I don't need to talk very much, but she does get a little antsy. This was a big problem early in our marriage. She was stuck at home with the kids all day, and they were little. So she had no, like, comprehensible adults to talk to. It's just she's been in the house with chattering little toddlers all day, and she just needs to, like, have a conversation with somebody who understands her words. But I've been at the office, right? I've been at the office all day having people talk at me constantly, and I'm like, oh, I just need to get home where it'll be quiet. And I walk in the door, and she's like, oh boy, the day I've hired, let me tell you everything about all the trivial little things that happened today. Oh, man. And, yeah, so it was bad. Yeah, my wife is more introverted than I am and so we have kind of the opposite thing although when I'm at work I talk to people and there's enough people around to talk to at home that it's not a problem um, but she she always tells the kids daddy has all the words go talk to him like, okay that's the same thing we say in our household like oh I'm out of words <laughs> like I'm fresh out <laughs> that's right so now she's so she has jobs outside of the house and that does a great job of balancing out her needs to talk. She goes out, socializes with people, and then comes home to her grunting, constantly distracted husband. <laughs> but it's cool. She's had good conversations. Like, we have, like, we have conversations. I don't want to make it sound like I ignore all the time. But we just don't have a lot. We don't sit around and talk for hours, right? But now she's off work because of the coronavirus thing. And I didn't even realize this was going to be a problem for me. The last few days, she's finally been getting like a little <laughs> stir crazy. And she keeps coming in the office and like telling me about stuff. Did you see this thing on Reddit? Did you see this thing? Did you hear this report? Did, and telling me about things that other people are doing. I'm like, listening patiently for why this is applicable to my life and then the story ends and i'm like i didn't need any of that information and it was starting to make me kind of crazy after a few, after a few days of this just <laughs> you know because she doesn't think she'll tell me something that does not apply to my life like i don't need this information it's something about your brother oh he's having some sort of drama oh he's got a project he's doing like, I know this this information will never apply to me. It's just filling up my brain and distracting me from my work. But if she's going to, like, ask me, you know, so what do you think? And I'm going to be like, uh, what? And do the thing of, like, you're not really listening. Right. And I'm trying not to be a jerk, <laughs> and I'm trying to listen. But it's hard because, you know, I was in the middle of work when this conversation started. And then I finally realized, holy cow, she isn't doing this just so that she can, like, quiz me on all this trivia of the world around. She's doing it because she needs to have a conversation. And I was like, oh, she's not leaving the house. She's not talking to people. So extroverts are trapped inside and going crazy because they're not getting to socialize like they need to and introverts are trapped in the house with those extroverts and are getting driven mad by them that's the problem <laughs> here everyone loses uh yeah well at least she's mostly introverted you're not yeah it's been right. days it's been weeks now right she's finally starting to overflow with right the need to talk to people 
And she's been sewing uh, masks, just uh, not yeah. surgical. My wife clients. did the same yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I think some of her masks, here's how bad it is. I think some of her masks are going to end up at the hospital. Like she's just giving them away. Oh, yeah. And they're like, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. And they're like, yeah, we need them. But she took some over to her brother and like left them on the porch. But he came out and they stood like 20 feet apart and had a conversation. And she, they talked for a while. And when she came home, she was all good. She like told me just, just a summer. Yeah, yeah, I got to see him. It was nice. Told me about what they're up to. And that was it. She didn't need to like repeat the entire conversation to me. She was full. She'd gotten her conversation in. And and then it was like two days of like, oh, this is so much better. <laughs> she wasn't <laughs> distracting me all the time. Because it's not her fault. I mean, you know, I need quiet. She needs to talk. One of us has to lose. Yeah, You've got to find yeah, a balance nothing in there with, somewhere. There's being extroverted. Yeah. Right, right. And we just got to find a balance. But it was really nice when we didn't have to find a balance. And she was content and I was content and everybody wins. So I, I wonder if other introverts are having this problem of just being cooped up in a house with extroverts and it driving them mad. Extroverts who are starving for conversation. Right, right. I imagine that there's got to be a lot of video conferencing and, and like phone calls and stuff happening because I can't imagine being extroverted and not being able to go out. Like that'd just be nightmarish. Right. Oh, it would just, yeah, it would drive you crazy. And I don't know, there are like certain things that I notice extroverts, like I said, talking to children doesn't fill you up, doesn't give you that need because they barely understand you, that everything they say is, an innate, is inane, <laughs> you know, and completely predictable. It's not filling up your, your social needs, right? And yeah. there's a lot yeah, of talking that. to children is like is like doing some sort of puzzle where you're like, what are you even attempting to say? Like all the words <laughs> right. are wrong, all the structure is incomplete. Like you didn't give me any context, and like where do we even start on trying to unravel this ball of yarn? Oh yeah, the no context. The kid walks up to you and goes, "It's stuck. I can't. It's it's stuck and it's too big." And you're like, "I." This could literally be about anything. <laughs> I Excuse can't wait me? to find that. <laughs> it's stuck. It's too big. It is. <laughs> it's right. And the then they dissolve into tears. And it's like, okay, first of all, it can't, like, you're not bleeding. So can't, you don't cry about this. Stop crying. <laughs> right. And then you're like, well, what's stuck? The yellow one. And you're like, what? <laughs> no, back up. Okay. Like, all the way to the beginning. Keep backing up. Just don't stop backing up. <laughs> right. And in fact, I think that's actually kind of draining, even as an extrovert. That's the impression I got from my wife. Is that that sort of made you hungrier for a real conversation. But there are other mm. things that I think don't count. Like, if you go to a meeting and have a technical conversation, a planning meeting, where there's no chit-chat or small talk... I don't think that fills you up either, just based on observation. I don't think anybody ever walks out of there and like, ah, that was a fulfilling conversation. So there's like very particular thing, like there's particular types of information that extroverts need to exchange in order to feel fulfilled. And I don't understand all of them. Hmm. Yeah. I, my, uh, my brother runs a, a martial arts studio and there's lots of little kids and stuff and he's mostly teaching little kids but he'll stop and talk to all the moms like you know that brought their kids in or waiting there uh before and after class and so i think that's where he gets his social interaction he's fairly extroverted and uh you know you, you get it in in between the work just like at work right the water cooler conversations Essentially. Yeah, exactly. Well, speaking of things that are hard on people, uh, I played Figment this week because it was free, not because I wanted to. So I'm going to assume this is another... I know nothing about this game. I've never even heard of it. 
I'm going to assume it's another Epic Games freebie. Yeah, yeah, it turns out most of the games I play these days, most of the ones I haven't played before anyway, are free from the Epic Games Store, but I'm not complaining. It was it was an interesting, it's an interesting experience. It's like a hand-drawn kind of artsy, um, what is it, isometric RPG, I guess? Okay. I should probably look this up while you tell me about it. It's yeah, yeah. It's on the you could you could get your own copy right now. Um, I might already the, the have it. The first weird thing that you <laughs> maybe you did, yeah. The the first weird thing that struck me about it is that the launcher is like it's got a whole thing advertising their other games and like this other games coming out, Figment Two or whatever, and uh, and that just felt kind of weird. I know that like there are splash screens and stuff and like. Um, I wonder a number, a number of the games I play have them. Um, well, Minecraft does now. It's got a, a launcher thing. Satisfactory's yeah. got a, like a little thing that comes up. It's not really, it's like the main menu, but they've got some news and stuff on there. Um, Oxygen Not Included has one. But this was like more blatant. It felt more like, like an advertising thing. And I was thinking like, okay, if you're going to put your game on epic for free or i don't know how that happens maybe they give you a fee or something like that but like if it's going up for free people aren't paying for this yeah it's fair to you know put some advertising in there try to get people interested in the other stuff you're doing like i can understand it but it still felt strange you know i was it's weird that you mentioned this i was just dealing with this earlier today i fired up cities skylines for the first time in a year and they've added a launcher to it so that when you launch the game, it doesn't launch the game. You know, you hit the button in Steam to launch the game, and then you go to get some coffee, and you think, yeah, okay, yeah. When, I, when I come back, that epic loading screen will be over. And then you come back, and it's like, no, oh, the launcher has started. And it's just <laughs> like selling me just DLC. Just waiting for now, your input, yeah. Right, and now I can hit... The, the two buttons available to you are resume and play. Which are both the play <sighs> button. One is just launch the game and launch my latest save. And the other one is launch the game. And when you get into the game, when you get into the game, it's just another... You know, it still has a splash screen selling you DLC and everything. So it's like, what is this launcher for? Oh, it's so annoying. So it... You kind of have to launch the game twice, and I really don't like this trend. Yeah. I was really impressed by Satisfactory's load times, just like you start it up and then you load a game, and it's like, I've got a pretty big save file, and it loads in like five seconds, four seconds? And that's pretty good, yeah. I assume you're loading off an SSD. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't get loading screen. Uh, I I don't get loading times like that. <laughs> oh well, I you know what my saves are on an SSD, but the game itself has to be on the hard drive because my game's drive is terabytes big, and several terabytes of SSD is crazy expensive. It does get it get does get steep, yeah. But anyway, so you were telling me about Figment. Yeah, so uh, it, it feels um, kind of carnivaly. Like, there's there are hints of, like, it's kind of, I don't know, campy. And and uh, it's not over the top. It's like, it's like budget campy. And I guess, I guess that's camp. Anyway, um, it, and it's kind of sparse. Like, it's all hand-drawn art and stuff, but the... It's like hand-drawn textures on 3D models, I think. Um, and there's not a lot of stuff in it. So it, it feels kind of empty at the same time. So it's like crowded like a carnival, but then also like when you're on the midway or whatever and there's like three empty stalls or whatever, and it just kind of feels vacant. Uh, it's got that feeling. So I don't know. It, it doesn't... It doesn't feel particularly good to play. Um, and then the the mechanics themselves, I don't know if this is just geared toward players with a different skill level or a different familiarity with 
the language of RPGs or something. But it felt like it didn't respect my ability to understand, like, I'm picking up what you're laying down, game, and, and then it just has me do the same thing, like, two more times right in a row. And I'm like, okay, I, is this chore time? Like, I didn't sign up to do a bunch of errands. <laughs> I wanted to have an interesting experience. And uh, I don't know, I just feel like it didn't, it didn't respect me as a, as a player fluent in, in the language that it was, it was using to convey to me. So it was like belaboring the tutorials? Uh, well, it didn't really have a tutorial, but it did have, it, it has like a puzzle that you're supposed to do, you, you know, solve this puzzle. You do this thing and then do that thing and do the other thing. And, okay, I did those things. And then it's like, do it again. And it's like, okay, uh, you're not going to change it up or anything? Nope, not going to change it up. Just do the same thing again. Okay, okay, now do it again a third time. <laughs> no, I don't <laughs> like this. I don't like this anymore. So, yeah, that kind of thing. Wow. I'm looking at it. Yeah, it does have a weird hand-drawn. It's obviously rendered, but it looks very hand-drawn. It looks like the whole world is made out of stuff you find in a junk drawer. Yeah. It's like Dr. Seuss a bit around the edges, but also just just like a child built the world out of stuff they found in their immediate vicinity. It's, you know, one of those games where the buildings are all kind of crooked and warped, which is, I, I think, generally a good thing. It kind of grates when you have too many mathematically perfect environments in a game. It feels too artificial. Yeah, it's true. It's true. That said, there is, you know, I'm always like, add more detail. You know, I don't want to, like, run through your box rooms and, you know, you know what I mean? Like, your subtracted cube room to shoot all the dudes. Yeah. That gets really, really boring. And the solution to that is add detail. And this game is almost overwhelming. It's like, you can't, I can't tell by looking at screenshots, like, what if this is gameplay and what if this is just, you know, doodles Set in the dressing. background. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing. It just, the Im you know, maybe it makes sense once you're playing the game, but it's like the, almost the opposite end of the spectrum where there's just so much going on. And even background, the background stuff is just as detailed as the foreground stuff. Again, yeah, there no, is a, yeah. a failure of communication with the visual language they use where, uh, like you said, they don't give preference to gameplay elements. So there's a lot of stuff where it's just like, this is just a piece of, you know, window dressing just there. Uh, but it's as, you know, it portrayed in exactly the same way as everything else. Right. Old adventure games had the same problem. They, uh, you know, somebody would just draw in pixel art the scene. And so you'd be like, oh, pick up Golden Goblet. And the game would be like, I don't see that here. And you're like, get cup. I don't <laughs> right. see that here. And, you know, you spend like five minutes trying to pick up or interact or examine all these things on all these shelves and you realize, oh, these are just background doodles. Like the script never mentioned these items. Somebody drew them because they wanted them in there. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe the the whole game was done before they started making the art. So like the game designer didn't even know there was a shelf with goblets on it. Right. Yeah. So yeah, uh, Figment, uh I don't know, I guess if if you like the style of the art, if you look at it and you're like, wow, that's really cool art. I wanna I wanna play in that world, um, go for it. Like you'll get more of that kind of thing. If you're like, oh, that looks kinda interesting, I wonder if it's fun to play, eh, give it a pass. Yeah. I would so call the art part part Seuss, part Terry Gilliam. And some people are going, oh, that's not for me. And somebody out there is going, oh, I need to play this right now. <laughs> so, good luck for you, whoever you are. I, there seems to be a game of clutter just for you. On the other side of games that I got for free on the Epic Game Store. Now, I've played Hob before uh, on, what is it, Discord, I think? Uh, 
Discord had like a... Do they still have a game subscription service? I don't know. I subscribed to it like two years ago and I haven't looked at it since. Yeah, same with me. I, I subscribed for a month and I was like, ah, I don't know if I'm getting my value out of this and or uh, I don't know, got distracted with other things. But so I played Hob a little bit on on there and uh, I just love I just love Hob. Like, I don't know what it is. Well, I mean, oh. I, I think I do know what it is. It's like I'm a mechanical engineer and it's just jam packed with overcomplicated, gratuitous, magical machines. And like, that's the whole game is just like magical machines popping out and spinning around and gears going everywhere and it's great i love it uh wow i saw your note saying overcomplicated, and i was like oh this we're in for a rant this week and no you're saying this is a good thing yeah it's i don't know there's something about the way that that world is built that's just uh it just hits the sweet spot for me like the the combat is there but it's not too hard um and it's mostly just a vehicle for giving you an excuse to like because like the whole landscape is part of this giant machine that you're locking together it's like a big puzzle that's you know the pieces are falling into place and i don't know it i love it the only thing that's annoying about it is something that is annoying for me about a lot of 3d platformer games that they it doesn't seem to give you the tools to convey with your character your intent. So like, I'll be running along a pathway and my intent is just like to keep running along the pathway. Um, but my character gets a little bit too close to the edge and he's like, oh, I'm falling off. I'm going to catch myself. And so then he spends like two seconds catching himself and then like climbing back onto the pathway. And while I appreciate they won't just have him like fall off and die because I got too up close to the edge. It is kind of annoying that like the game doesn't have any any way to tell it like just run down the path. Like I'm not trying to do anything crazy here. All I'm oh, doing right. is just walking forward. Or like jumping at the edge of a precipice. I remember in the original Tomb Raider, they had this great system where if you hold down the jump button while you're running toward an edge, Laura waits until she gets to the edge and then just jumps as far as she can off the edge. Right, like, right. I, I don't know why they don't do that anymore with any, like, is that copyrighted or something? Is there a patent on that technology? Yeah, the the original Prince of Persia, OG 1989 Prince of Persia, had the same thing. Like, if you press the jump button as you're sprinting towards a ledge, anywhere near the edge, it, like, you know, will line it up so that you jump at the last possible moment. Right. And, and that was like, much in appreciated. Real life, I can do that. Like, I can tell my body, all right, I want you to to get your your pace all set up so that your feet are running at the right spacing so that your foot lands right at the edge there and then I'm going to jump right before that edge. And like you set it all up and your body does all that work for you. And I'm kind of hoping that someone will figure out how to make the character in the game be able to do that cuz like I, and I miss jumps all the time too in Hobbit. I'm trying to like jump across this gap toward this other platform. And they do a really decent job of of lining up the platform so that they're at the cardinal angles. I'm I'm playing with with um Wazd on the keyboard. And so like there's a lot of jumps that are straight up and down, you know, top to bottom on the screen, straight side to side on the screen and 45 degree angles. So it's like that's cool. But sometimes occasionally they're at weird angles and then like what am I supposed to do? <laughs> like I, I there is some air steer but not a lot of air steer and I'm you know I'm not trying to do anything crazy. I'm just trying to get my character to jump from this obvious platform to that obvious platform over there. And like, if I could select it on the screen with the mouse, I would do that. But you don't give me the tools <laughs> to convey right. what I'm trying to do. And it's not a hard jump. It's just hard to tell the game what I'm trying to do. And the game already knows what I'm trying to do. So like, help me out here, game. Right, and I feel the same way about so many platformers, and what I anticipate the... Um, I've said before, I'm not a fan of platformers. Um, and what I anticipate platformer fans would say is, that's the game. Getting those timings down is the game. I don't... It, it sort of annoys me that it's 
challenging to get around. You know, like is that is it supposed to be a challenge to walk down this this pathway to the next puzzle area? Is that yeah. an intended challenge or is this just supposed to make it feel is this for the the sense of kinesthetics? I don't know. On the other hand, yeah. I loved I loved Prince of Persia Sands of Time, and that was very much getting around and getting those timings down is the game. And I've never been able to figure out why I loved Prince of Persia Sands of Time so much. And yet, if you simplify that and put it into 2D, I instantly get frustrated and bored and hate it. Like, I've never... Did it have good camera controls? Yeah, it had... I believe it had auto camera for a lot of the puzzle sections. It, it kind of like a Mario game where, okay, there's only one way to approach this cliff face. So the camera knows where it needs to go to give you the best view. So you don't need yeah. to like fuss with it. It, I think you can move the camera around if you want to, or if you want just a different angle to judge the difference, the distance. But, for the most part, you don't need to manually move the camera when you're just, you know, traveling in a straight line. It'll handle it for you. Yeah. Hob has a, a fixed angle, like, three-quarter, you know, perspective camera kind of up in the air. So it's kind of like a... It's a third person. It's not a first person kind of thing, but it's also not over the shoulder like I think Prince of Persia was. Right. And it does a pretty good job of... of keeping the camera at the right angle. It'll swivel the camera around in some places, and sometimes it goes to a low angle, and sometimes a high angle. It's very right. pretty. It's got really nice stuff, but occasionally there are there are level design stuff that's set up, and the camera angle is set up, and it's like, this is... It's hard to, to get right. And if, it, if that was all the time, then okay, maybe that's part of the game, but it, it's not... Like, it's only occasionally. Most of the time, it, everything's just, like, you know, run exactly sideways, and, and it's fine. So it makes me think that maybe it just needed another polishing pass or two. On Steam, there's a warning here where you buy the game. It says, a controller is strongly recommended to play this game. Ah. Uh, I'll bet they don't have that warning on the Epic Game Store. <laughs> I, I don't even know if Epic has a page for it. Right. Uh, the other thing is, I've been trying to figure out where I've seen this before. It's Joseph Anderson. Yes. Did yes. one of his epic 25-minute reviews of this thing. And that's where I've seen it before. It is super gorgeous. He said it's like Zelda, which I've only played uh, Ocarina of Time, so I'm not like the biggest Zelda expert in the world. So I don't know to what degree... You know, when somebody says, it's like Zelda, it's like, well, I've only played one of them, so I don't really know. In fact, I didn't even finish Ocarina of Time. I got to the Water Temple, and I was like, nope. I'm out. <laughs> nope to write out, huh? Right. Thanks for the fun, but I'm not doing this. This is super annoying. Uh, so when well, somebody says if something you'd like to, to pick Zelda, it up for free... Yeah. On the, you know, Hob is, is available. It's, uh, it is buggy. I, I had it, I, I've been sold it on three machines so far. Two of the machines it would not run because it couldn't find the DLLs it needed. Um, and the third one, it has crashed once. So Ooh. it's a little unstable. Um, but if you're willing to download DLLs off the internet, you could probably get it running. Well, it's gorgeous. I will have a link to the trailer in the show notes because it is, even if you don't buy the game, watch the trailer. It's super beautiful. Like, this is just a work of art. Visually. Yeah. Oh. It, it's, a, it's amazing. It's an amazing experience. So I got an email this week that's very interesting. Like, not a it, mailbag email, but in, like a, in no. your normal email account. Right. This person doesn't address me by name. They say, hello, I stumbled across your videos. I really like video essays. I made some, I've released some music you can use as background for your, for your videos. 
and he, you know, links to links to his SoundCloud, links to his Spotify, and everything. And I'm like, this is a long sales pitch for somebody that just wants you to use their music. And they claim, hey, this music is free on the YouTube, like, you know, it's released under Creative Commons. He doesn't use that word, but, you know, so that you won't get copyright huh. striked. That's looking awfully at this. suspicious. Like, right? Like, I, if you're, if you're going to send someone music, like, you're just like, hey, I... I like your videos, and but I noticed that you don't have a lot of music. So here's some music I made. Feel free to use it however you like. You don't say like, don't worry about getting a copyright strike against your channel if you use this music. That would never happen. Like, that just makes you sound like a con artist. Um, and they don't address me by name or the name of my video. So this is, I'm willing to guess, a form letter that just gets sent to a bunch of creators. I mean. Hey, I found yeah. your channel. I really like video essays. It's like, wow. You meet Stephen King. Hey, I I stumbled across your books. I really like words. I'm a huge fan <laughs> of words. It's like, of, it feels a of, little of words and books. And they've been bound together. It's, it gets me on. Uh, yeah. Oh, I read them all the time in in books. All the time, I'm so into them and all your work that you have that is that is in books. <laughs> so, I'm like, okay, what's the angle here? This is a lot, like, is this person seriously just promoting their work because they want more people to use their Creative Commons music? I mean, that's possible. Maybe they want to be the new Kevin McLeod, where just... Everybody on the internet uses that. I mean, there's a certain pleasure to that. Even though it doesn't make you a lot of money, or any money, there's certain joy to know that, hey, look at how far and wide my work has spread. I can totally yeah. understand that. I can understand that, yeah. But I'm like, okay, maybe, but this doesn't feel like an artist that... This isn't the kind of email I would send. And so I'm like, <laughs> this is not the kind of email someone laboring in a labor of love would compose. Right. Well, maybe, maybe the internet has made me jaded and bitter. But my guess is, the, okay, my guess, I have no proof of this. This person might be totally honest. But I'm thinking, what if this person is promoting their work? trying to get a bunch of people to begin using their music and they'll let the copyright... You can let a copyright strike or claim sit for a long time. I found this out when I came back to my uh. YouTube channel. And there were a bunch of, hey, we found a match on this person that had reposted your video. And I go through and it's got like eight views or so, you know, just some idiot re-uploaded my thing and YouTube wanted to tell me about <laughs> wow. it. Hey, do you want to do you want to claim this person or hey this person is a similar you know some some reposting stuff and i'm like oh who cares and so i just deleted them but they were had been sitting there for years and i wonder if this person is planning to just sit there wait for a bunch of videos to come in hey this person's using your music and then claim them all at once and then just soak up ad revenue from a bunch of people it's not a bad plan. I mean, aside from the evil, yeah, it's a good plan. <laughs> I was I was thinking that they probably have a bunch of copyrighted music that you know that they own the copyright to, and then they made a sock puppet account, re-uploaded that music, linked you to the sock puppet account to see like, hey, look, it's under Creative Commons, there's no problem with it. You look at that and you're like, oh yeah, it is checks out but what they're doing is they're not enforcing the copyright claims on themselves and then when you right. upload it they can enforce it on you right either way very suspect i wonder if they, i mean this is so funny youtube keeps building these systems and people keep finding different ways to exploit them and so you can get copyright claimed for trivial things like oh i used 
when I uploaded Hamlet, or I cited Hamlet a few videos ago. And Hamlet, you know, the ultimate public domain story, but here's a movie version with Mel Gibson. <laughs> right. And I used like 10 seconds of footage, flipped. And okay, technically, according to copyright law, I gather this if you're not critiquing the work in question, if you're using the work to create, to critique another work, you are not necessarily safe. That will, will not always qualify as fair use. So technically, you mm -hmm. can make the case, I'm totally infringing on this. True, by law, perhaps I was in the wrong. But morally, I was not hurting the copyright holder in the slightest. Like, this is not why copyright was designed to make sure that, no, nobody should ever cite my work unless they get my permission for it. Like, it's just right. so right. petty and small-minded. Nobody's going to go, yeah. I'm not going to... Are they afraid that you're going to have, like, chopped up videos spread over a thousand video essays with, like, talking over them, and you've, like, center-panned it exactly so that they can cut the audio out with a vocoder and... and pitch the thing back together so they can get the whole video of Hamlet that they could have just downloaded off the pirate bay. <laughs> right? Right? Like, this is not competing for, you know, nobody's going to say, oh, I don't need to get this movie. I've seen 12 seconds of it flipped on Seamus' channel. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, well, maybe they would. Maybe they're afraid that their there's stuff isn't up to snuff, and if you show any of it, they'll just be found out as a fraud. So it's just like YouTube built this big, unwieldy, goofy system. And it's like on some some one end, companies are just being so overzealous. And they're not doing it because they want to... They're not doing it because, oh, we need to protect the copyright on this movie. They're doing it because they're like, hey, free money. Look, yeah, this system hey, allows us enough. to skim money from a bunch of private city. This money allows us to go along to street buskers and scoop everything out of their hat and walk away with it <laughs> legally. Right. Why don't we just do that? Right. <laughs> the, the law says it's okay, so it must be okay. Hey, There's you know, you could probably do that it. in real life with real street buskers. and I mean, They're not going to stop you, right? He's not going to, like, put his guitar down and chase you down the street. For three bucks? Yeah, you should just... We should just get all these bigwigs to, like, go down on the street and, and perform petty theft on street buskers. Right. Universal mu Music Group, just their board of directors, will just go around robbing street buskers. <laughs> That'd make a really good YouTube video, actually. Yeah, it really would. Oh, boy. So, anyway, YouTube... A system on one part, you know, allows companies to basically rob people. It's legal that the law says they can do it, but it's this giant system that makes it super easy and gives you all these incentives to do it. And then on the other, on the other end, it has all these exploitable systems so that random people can, you know, constantly, you know, oh, you insulted me, so I'm going to copyright strike your video. <laughs> You criticized me. I don't like it, so I'm going to strike your video. Just like the whole thing is this giant, malfunctioning, monstrous thing. It's funny. It's funny when it's not uh, working against you. The only thing keeping this from ballooning into a critique of society as a whole is the rule against political discussion. So let's move on to another YouTube topic. <laughs> right, right. This is a very hard. I can, I can hear you talking while also biting your tongue. Uh, I'm so, I'm trying so hard. Um, so no I have a YouTube Premium subscription. I signed up for YouTube Premium so I wouldn't have to watch ads, and I could, you know, watch videos as much as I like, and don't get interrupted, and download them on my phone, and all that stuff. And it's, it's nice. I, I've been enjoying it. It's like wait, wait, twelve wait. bucks a YouTube month or something. Premium? YouTube Premium allows you to download videos? Uh, kind of. You can, on your mobile device, you can, like, preload them oh. so that if you don't have an internet connection when you're, you know, out at the club or whatever, then you can watch the videos. Um, I thought that maybe you could download them on desktop, but you can't, so you have to, you know, capture them the old normal way. Oh, get a piece of software to do it for you. Yeah, exactly. which is what I do. All right, I'm sorry. Please continue. 
yeah, so anyway, I, I have a YouTube premium account and um, today I got an email saying, hey, for YouTube premium members, you can have three months free on Stadia Pro. Oh no, what did you do to anger them? <laughs> Why and, would they and I was like this on you? I was like, I I do not care about Stadia at all, Google. Like I I can't I can't care about it. But I am on this this podcast where we talk about video games. So you know what? Fine, I'll do it. I'll sign up. Sign me up, Google. Give me the Stadia experience. Oh no. So the first thing that I had to do was download the app onto my phone. Um, which okay fine like maybe this is just to get you to download the app uh so you download the app and you have like confirm your account and confirm you can link it to your google account or whatever um and then it's like okay and you're gonna sign up to pay 10 bucks a month right you'll get the first three months free but after that you have to pay 10 bucks a month unless you cancel okay fine okay and we can use your credit card okay yeah yeah all right i, I understand i understand the deal so sign up, you know, click all the yes boxes, and um, then it, what did it do? It, it dropped me into uh, controller selection, I think, and it's like, okay, select all the controllers that you own that work with Stadia, and I'm like, oh, Stadia, I don't have any of those controllers. And uh, Shouldn't you and have asked that before you had me put in my credit card number, you bastards? Right, exactly. So, so, so like, all right, fine. And, and, and to be fair, like on the page that says like, you have three months free, whatever, like on there, there's, you know, the fine text with the hyperlink that says, you know, you can see all your system specs here. And like, here's the list of all the things you'll need. Yeah. I didn't read any of that. Cause I just wanted to go in blind and, and see what the deal was. So then it boots up the, it's like installing the, oh, oh, okay. So this is, this is. Uh, it's such a such a stroke of hubris. So they when the app is loading or not after it's installed But like when you boot it up the first time it comes up with a screen and it's like, you know starting up for the first time But the text on the screen is building Rome Wow That's Is that Hubris I I think so like it's is a reference to Rome wasn't built in a day. I, I think and right. uh, they're like, oh, yeah, they they couldn't build Roma today, but we can. And it's like, okay, Google, first off, you're not, you're not building Rome, Google. <laughs> and secondly, <laughs> like, why is this app taking so long to load? I just installed it. Like, shouldn't it have been installed already? This is like the installing Microsoft it, it distributable files thing when you boot up a game. Like, it shouldn't have this problem. Why is it? St I installed it twice and it's still not installed. What's going on here? Exactly. So anyway, all right. So, um, then it drops me in the page. And it's like, okay, here's all the games you can buy. But because you're on Google Stadia Pro, you get all these games for free. And there's like a whole list of games. It's like Destiny Two and some racing game and a bunch of stuff. Um, but you can't just play them. You have to like claim each one like on the Epic Game Store kind of thing. You click on the game and then you click the, the claim button and then it does this little it thinks about it for a little bit and it's like, now you have claimed this game, now you can play it. And that's and that's fine, I guess. Like again, I see what they're trying to do. They're trying to get you in the habit of clicking on the button to purchase the thing and then waiting for the purchase to go through and like that's you know, they're trying to habituate it. Same thing with the Epic Game Store. They're trying right. to habituate purchasing games there. And, and like, okay, like, I'm an adult. Uh, that's not going to work on me. That wouldn't even work <laughs> on children. But <laughs> right. I see what you're trying to do. And, like, I don't respect it, but I understand it. Um, so then I, I claim all these games. I just go down the list of all the ones that are free. I'm like, I'm going to claim all these games. I'm going to play every one of them. And I'm just going to see what happens. Like, this is, this is going to be interesting. Because I'm, I'm on my mobile. Like, I'm sitting in my living room. I could be anywhere with a good internet connection. Um, so like, this is kind of cool. Like I could be playing destiny Two, sitting on my couch, like with my mobile phone, maybe there'll be like some sort of, uh, mobile interface. Cause I, I recently booted up, uh, steam streaming or whatever it is like steaming streaming from your desktop thing on your mobile phone. Have you ever tried that? No. 
Oh, it's it's oh wait, it's yeah, very yeah, interesting. Like streaming it like to your t streaming it to like the television. Yeah, yeah. Well, I did it to my phone where I was playing Stardew Valley with my wife, and I was sitting on the couch, and she was on the computer, and then my other computer in the other room was streaming the game to my phone, and like it's got the little touch screen stuff, and uh, you know screen screen controls. I did that as a test. I didn't actually play it. I was just like, yeah, broadcast to my TV. Okay, that works. Neat. Um, I have no use for this. <laughs> and then I went back right. to just playing right. normally. Yeah, it's it's a it's a interesting it's an interesting ability. I if I had a controller that was like a Bluetooth controller or something, then I could see playing on my phone remotely just to be able to like walk around with it and stuff or, you know, keep playing when I'm going to the bathroom or something. I don't know. But so I was expecting like, okay, Stadia is going to have that same kind of thing where it's like, okay, you don't have a controller, but you bought this service, you're paying for it ostensibly, we're pretending that you're paying for it. So here's a way to play these these AAA games on your phone with like no controller. Um, but I ran into a problem even before I got to the controller part, which is that my phone is not on the list of supported devices. What? But it. But how did they not notice that? <laughs> I know. How did they, how did they not notice that? And secondly, how do you build a video streaming service when you're owned by the company that owns YouTube and can't just stream to any old device? Right. Yeah. If you can stream to a television. Yeah, like, is it, what's the, what's the hitch? Now, you, you can, you can do it on, like, these Pixel, Pixel phones and these Android phones and stuff, and then to stream it to a television, it has to be on, like, a, I don't know, whatever the, some sort of streaming, like, pro dongle or something. Like, you gotta buy, like, this fancy thing. And maybe it's the decoder has to be fast enough, or, like, it's got some sort of crazy hardware codec that, that decodes it in hardware or something. I have to imagine it's something like that, because otherwise it just doesn't make any sense. Like, why couldn't you just stream to any device? And even if, even if it wouldn't be as fast, like, it's still better than nothing. Like, like it's right. You're gonna be able to decode it somehow. Like, downres the resolution if you need to, add some latency if you need to. Like, there's already gonna be network latency. There's already gonna be hardware latency on the other end. There's already gonna be hardware latency on this end. So why not have a little bit extra? Like, I, and I guess it's. The same kind of thing where they don't want screenshots of the game in, like, potato mode with all the settings turned down, right. floating around. And they probably don't want, like, Stadia guys streaming on their four-year-old phone and, you know, it's real slow and buggy. And then they tell all their friends, oh, don't bother with Stadia, it's, it's a buggy mess. But, like, would you rather have someone buy a subscription to Stadia and then find out they can't stream from their phone at all? Right. Right. Oh, that's terrible. So, my phone wasn't supported. Um, and then, also, you definitely actually need... So then I went to the page where it's like, okay, what do I actually need? And, you know, like, let's get serious here. What is this actually ever going to work? No, it's not. I don't have a controller that's supported. And it's not any old controller. It has to be, like, a whole list. And there's... It's not just the Stadia controller, but it's a limited list. I think there's eight of them. Um... And, uh, yeah, it, and then it's just, you know, it's not going to work. So then I uninstalled Stadia and I canceled my subscription. And uh, they're like, if you ever want to resume, you've still got three months. So, you know, anytime until July 4th, when our alien death ships will come and blow up the capital or whatever. <laughs> wow, Stadia is just like... They feel new. They feel new to this. Like, not just new to running a streaming service, they kind of feel new to gaming. Like, hey kids, we're here to do a video games with you. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. How do you do, who fellow wants, kids? Who wants, to, who wants to light up some video games together? <gasps> uh, Linus Tech Tips, which is one of my favorite YouTube channels. Oh, yeah. It's good stuff. It's so, so good. 
did a side-by-side -side comparison of NVIDIA or GeForce Now or whatever it's called versus Stadia. And it was humiliating for Stadia that you, they like, for one thing, the latency was better, which you'd think, come on, you're Google. How do you have problems? But that might just be, you know, th these tests are noisy. Maybe if they tested it a few other times, it wouldn't have been as bad. But the other thing is that Google's compression system or something about Google's setup degraded the images far more than GeForce huh. Now. And what it did is it absolutely crushed um, the dim values, the blacks in the image. So uh, this side of this wall here was really dimly lit in, in GeForce Now. This was a, a dimly lit thing. They were looking in an outdoor area, I think near the beginning of the game, where there's a bunch of cars around, like old wrecked cars. And sure. it's super bright sunlight, so it's, you know, they're bright on one side and then very dark on the, unrealistically dark on the other. But, like, in the Google Stadia version, the dark side of the cars were pitch black. Just absolute, could not see anything, all color values set to zero. As if somebody had cranked the contrast. And I was like, why would they do... Oh, because that would make it way easier to compress. That would save <laughs> right? a ton of of image size. But of course, it's terrible to look at. And so Google's like, well, you can stream your games at 60 frames a second at 4K. And it's like, yeah, but you've ruined the images. I'd gladly go... I'll <laughs> gladly go back to 1080p. If you'll just give me my color, but colors back, like what's the point? Oh man, okay. So Google just needs to like Stadia just needs to go in all in on this and make like Neuer mode, where everything's like black or white, and it's always raining in every game, and every, all the everything's <laughs> smeared out and blurry. It'll be great. Perfect. Oh, so weird, so weird. They're still trying. They haven't given up yet. But they've been trying for months, and it's just, there doesn't even seem to be any hope. There's no light at the end of this tunnel. There's no, oh, did you hear Google? Stadia's getting kind of good lately. Have you noticed? Like, yeah. it's I still mean, just the whole no thing Man's is awful. Sky got good after a while, kind of. Right? <laughs> Boy. But I don't know. It's, it must be that they're they're working for this mega corporation that just doesn't know what failure means. Right. Well, we know what failure means. Yeah, we don't have that problem. Let's do some mailbag questions. Actually, I think we're only going to have time for one here. Dear Diecast, I am a huge fan of Fallout New Vegas. I like you. I like this person already. However, everything grows a bit stale over time. I am considering purchase, purchasing Fallout and Fallout 2, but I am hesitant because they are really old. And while I love Fallout New Vegas, I can't stand Fallout 3 or 4. Furthermore, Seamus had said some of the problems started with Fallout 2, but I've never heard anyone talk about Fallout 2 unless they were rightfully moaning about what Bethesda did to Jet. What were some of the major issues that started with Fallout 2? Should I deep dive into the original games or mod the ever-loving hell out of Fallout New Vegas? If the latter, do you have any recommended mods? Sincerely, Ty. This is a big and complicated question. Paul, do you have any familiar familiarity with the Fallout series? I do not. I've never played them. Uh, I'm mostly familiar with them through the uh, the video series, of, um, spoiler warning, on your site. So, uh, you know much more than I do. All right. So, here is a newbie's sort of overview to the first two games. First game, lovely world building. The interface, it's 2D overhead. Now, you might think, oh, kind of like Diablo. But no, not that good. It doesn't smoothly scroll. 
and it's turn-based combat. Now, I don't mind. It's got a hex grid, and I'm, I'm into hex grids. But it's turn-based, and when you get to the edge of the screen, there's it jumps to a different screen. So areas oh, are no. kind of contained. Uh, not totally. You can scroll around, but it's not smooth scrolling with your character locked in the middle like Diablo. It's not this silky smooth. It's... It's kind of like an old RTS where you hit the side of the screen with your m mouse and it'll sort of stutter, scroll to the side so you can see more stuff. It's not... And then, and then you'll eventually get to the edge of the area where you'll have what used to be a loading screen. It's just blink and you'll miss it now, but uh, jump to another zone. So that's not great. Doesn't feel great. Doesn't look great. Um, Fallout 2, the, the problem with Fallout 2 that a lot of people, well, that I'm not a fan of, is it got a bit weird with its lore. For instance, the need to explet, explain what Jet is. I consider that a classic sign that a property has been handed off to someone new. I don't know if that's the case. But that's what it feels like. You hand your world off to someone new, and instead of adding to it, they begin explaining parts of it. Here's where this came from. Did you ever wonder why this guy became an assassin? Now you can. Do you ever wonder what why this guy has an eye patch? You know, explaining all the minutia that was just sort of taken for granted in the original game, instead of using that as a backdrop to tell similar stories. Um, Fallout 2 did a lot of that. It mm. moved the time it moved the timeline forward, which I wasn't crazy. I mean, you were almost two centuries after the bombs fell. Um, and it began integrating a lot of silly things. Uh, <laughs> like there was ghouls with Tommy guns. I'd forgotten about them. There there were some silly characters. Huh. So, so now that I'm thinking of it, maybe Jet was invented in the second game, and I'm confusing this with something else. It's literally, don't flame me in the comments. I haven't played Fallout 2 in almost two decades. It's it's been more like 15 years. So my memory is very, very hazy. So I remember it being much sillier and a little more needing to explain all the minutia of the original game. That, I don't think needed to be explained. It was part of the setting. Like, you know, in Star Trek, we don't need to know all the details of a phaser and how it works and who built it. And, you know, it's just you, they carry phasers and they go on adventures. Right. Yeah. When you get a first course in a meal and you're like, oh, this is pretty good. And then the second course is just like the, the ingredients for the first course. And you're like, I... Mm. It's not very funny. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Fallout 2 had stability problems. There was a fan-made patch, and maybe there's been an official patch since then. I had to download a fan-made patch to get through the initial area. Fallout 2 has balance problems. And so, yeah, Fallout 2 is definitely the weaker of the two games. But it is still stronger than Fallout <laughs> so 3 or 4. Better. It's just been yeah. downhill all the way, folks. Sorry to break it to you. <laughs> right? It has been. I think if you were to put them in order of quality, it would be release order, except I think you'd swap Fallouts 3 and 4 around. But yeah. Okay, so where does Fallout New oh, wait, Vegas but, but, in Yeah, that that's list? true. That's that's true. I would put I would put it I would put it first or second. Mm, yeah, probably second. It, my big complaint with New Vegas, it, um, Ty here says um, everything grows a bit stale over time. That really happened for me with New Vegas. I've only been through it twice. It just the whole world's the same color, and it's mm -hmm. very. You're very like the intended order. There's a lot going on. You were supposed to visit these towns in this order, and it's very hard to break away from that without just running into, without needing to save scum past high level 
enemies that'll just one shot kill you. So it's very restrictive. There's not a lot of advantage to playing it through over and over again. Where if you have something like I'm going to say something positive about Fallout 4, so brace yourself. In Fallout Oof, 4, sitting down. you start the game. Yeah, you start the game and you can kind of head pretty much in any direction. Like that whole upper left corner of the map is just do that in any order. Just expand out from from there and find adventure. So on subsequent playthroughs, you can go to different places in different orders, pursue different quest lines. Fallout New Vegas gets old because so many of your playthroughs, by necessity, are going to be the same. You, you know, you could start a game of Fallout 1 and like, so what would happen if I were to just go straight to Junktown and skip the initial towns? Like, you, you can't really do that in Fallout New Vegas. And it all looks very much, you know, the same. It's all the same color of orange everywhere. And that might make sense for the setting, but it's still, you know, visually monotonous. So I would suggest give Fallout 1 a try. And if it's not your thing, I mean, it should be like five bucks on GOG. It is super cheap. And if it doesn't work for you, mod the hell out of New Vegas. That's my suggestion. <laughs> Because it's not getting any better than that. Right. All right. I think this is also a short question. So we'll do one more. Hi. I suppose it's more applicable to Seamus, but maybe Paul would be happy to add his take as well. We often talk about graphics in games, but barely about sound. I myself started to care about it only when I bought a good headset a few years ago and learned the usefulness of 3D positioning. So I actually want to ask you two related questions. What audio setup do you use? Audio, card, headset, loudspeakers, etc. And B, were there any games which audio sounds you place in very high regard? Best regards, Deadly Dark. Paul, do you have anything to say about your sound system or about games you think have great sound? Yeah, I have a, a high-quality pair of gaming headphones, and I drive them off my... Yeti microphone. It's got a very nice D to A converter, and um, when I'm when I'm gaming seriously, trying to you know do everything right, uh, that's the setup I use, and it it works really well. It gives me the positional data I need. I don't know if you'd get better data with a five point surround. Uh, you might, but you'd have to have a whole room designed for it, and I I don't. So that's as good as I can get at this point. I actually am drowning in audio devices. For whatever reason, this computer has... Well, I have... Each of my monitors has, you know, says, Hey, I can do sound. They, they can really pass through sound. So my monitors don't have built-in speakers. But you can drive sound through them, right? So that you could use the monitor's volume control. Sure. And it'll hand it off to speakers. So when I open up my sound controller, I've got the 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 proper sound system that goes with the computer, then each of my monitors, then my Yeti microphone, just like yours, and then there's one more that I've never been able to figure out what it is or why it's there. <laughs> so I've got all these sound things and every time and I can never remember, wait a minute. Which of, this, which of these is the one I normally use? You know, USB will get plugged or unplugged or shuffled around or a monitor will get turned off and Windows will lose track of a sound device for, you know, 15 milliseconds. And then it's like, oh, well, I guess I'll just forget everything then. And it's just like, goes back to the computer's default sound, which doesn't even have, isn't even plugged into speakers. <laughs> right. Oh, no. So then I have to remember which of these. So then I have to remember which of these devices is like, wait, which is the one I normally use? Oh, I'll, I'll look behind my monitor and see where everything's plugged in. <laughs> oh, right, this one, this one. Yikes. Uh, um, I, I have cheap speakers from Target that I think sound pretty good. I am not... 
a stickler for sound quality. Like, I, I don't care. Games could... I, I'm not like one of those purists that's like, no, I need maximum bit rate at maximum, you know, sampling rate and, and just the highest quality audio. It's way, way more important to me that the audio be very... that there's a rich soundscape to the game. Like, my big gripe mm. is you... Is you go into Skyrim and your the dungeons all all sound exactly the same and it's all just this vague sense of like echoing slightly echoing white noise like air gently moving through a cavern not bad but every single dungeon sounds like that and it just gets old. One of the first mods I download is one that just makes the soundscapes really complex. There's a lot. Different rooms will sound differently. The ambient sounds of, like, rocks crumbling in the distance or, you know, something going bang. In the di just to break it up. To make it more interesting. And that, to me, is so much more important than positional audio or the quality of your speakers or any of that is, you know, it's almost the graphics argument again, where I don't care about having 4K resolution and, you know, maximum using latest shader technology. I want to see something that was beautifully made by talented artists. That's way more important to me. So it's and, not and fidelity. We'll 60 frames a second. Right. You now I am a bit of a frame rate snob. But, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I would rather play a, I would rather play a beautifully made, brilliant, artistically brilliant game at thirty at twenty frames a second than play a box shooter with boring levels at sixty. Just art trumps all of that stuff. So yeah, that's where I. So I'm not so picky about the equipment. It's more about what's in the game. That's what I care about. I don't remember the names of any of my sound devices except my Yeti. And the only reason I, I know that is, is just because um, it says it right here on the microphone. Oh, wait, that says blue. I'm wrong. Yeah, it doesn't actually say Yeti on there. All right. Well, then I don't know I'm why I remember to, I'm that. trying to look up the, the name of my headset, but it doesn't. it's got like a Y and an X on it, I think. I don't tell anyone, but I bought it at GameStop. Oh, wow. They sell things at GameStop? Is it a used pair? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, it was new. I actually bought them for the diecast, and then I was like, as long as I'm buying headphones, I may as well get a nice pair. I don't have a nice pair, and so now I've got a nice pair. Um, as far as games where I've really been happy about the audio, uh, I'm... I'm... A, I'm kind of a, a I go two ways on games. If it's a if it's a game that is um that is not twitchy, I guess, that doesn't require fast reaction times and spatial awareness and stuff, then uh the positional audio doesn't really matter to me. Like it's kind of cute, but it doesn't give me critical information. At that point, it's just, yeah, like Seamus said, does it have uh, a good feel to it? Does it have a good a sense of place? And and then, of course, the music, but you said excluding the music. So um, for games that are twitchy, yeah, the, the positional data is really, really important. And, and like in front of or behind walls, that kind of thing where it mutes the high tones or uh, oh, yeah. different things in the game, like different kinds of... of characters or weapons or whatever having a different sound signature those are all really important um who does it really well well overwatch of course is kind of like the poster child for really great sound design um satisfactory is actually pretty good i i put on headphones and and whenever I'm out exploring, because the sound of the monsters is all unique and the positional data is good enough that I can tell where they are relative to me. And so that's, it's nice. I think anything that uses a, a modern game engine is going to be pretty good because uh, they've all got that built in. Yeah. Um, 
PUBG was was pretty good. I used to play a lot of PUBG, and and that's it has very uh, recognizable signatures for all the weapons, and it falls off over distance and uh, all that stuff. So that's that's really good. Well, I feel like we've done a show. What do you say, Paul? Yeah, yeah, we've we've made it. We've made it happen. Um, we have a mailbag here. Uh, we'll get to that next week. And if anybody else has any questions for the show, the email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye. Goodbye.